Welcome back guys, it's Israel. So, you have a brand new .NET API and you want to quickly create a database without having to go into like SQL Server Manager or the equivalent and manually have to create every table, every column, blah, blah, blah. You'd rather just create your API, create your classes and create your DB context and then just throw that into the database and poof, like magic, it would create it. Well, what if I could tell you that all of that and more is possible using Entity Framework and the code first approach. So let's talk about what that is and how to do it in your API. So let's get into it. But first, I just want to give a quick thank you to all my channel members. Thank you for their support. And if you want to also see your name here, as well as get access to all the code from all my videos, click the link below or click the join button on my profile and then send an email to this email with the code that you want access to. But now into the video. So the code first approach, what is it? Well, first of all, we're using Entity Framework to make it all possible. So now, what is it? What is the code first approach? It's the approach where you have your Entity classes that you create beforehand, and then using Entity Framework, it goes ahead and creates the database schema based on those classes. This approach can maybe be better when you have a brand new project using a brand new database that you are creating. It allows you to just save a little bit of time. You don't really have to worry about the database side of things because also maybe you don't have access uh, to the database because of roles or privileges. So using the code first approach, using your models, you can just create the database schema and apply it to the database without ever actually needing to go in there and manually create anything. But now, how do you actually do it in your .NET API? Let's see it. All right, guys. So I've gone ahead and created a brand new .NET 9 API. All I've done is get rid of the weather forecast stuff that's in the controller and this class and because we don't need it, right? So what is the first thing that we're going to do here? Well, we need our entity framework NuGet packages. So let's go ahead and install those. So to make it all work, we're going to need to install a few NuGet packages. So first of all, Microsoft.EntityFramework.Core. Let's install that one. Next, we're going to need these three right here. So we're going to need Entity Framework Core.Design. So let's install that one. Next, we're going to need Entity Framework Core.SQL Server because SQL Server is what we are working in. So we're using SQL right now. But if you were using another database, you would need to find the equivalent package for that database. And then the last one that we're going to need is Entity Framework Core.Tools. And this should be the last NuGet package that we're going to need to make sure that the code first approach works successfully. So now the next thing that we can do is just start setting up our API with sort of the things that we're going to need. So we also need the app settings. So we're going to need our connection string in here. Not for the code first approach, but in a little bit, you'll see why. So we're going to be creating an MBA database and it's just going to be from scratch. So obviously in the code first approach, we're creating a database from scratch using our models. So with models, we're going to need a models folder. So I'm going to go ahead and do add folder and it's going to be models. So this is where we're going to have all of our classes that are going to be turned into our database schema. First up, we need a DB context. So we're going to go ahead and go into our models, new item, and we're going to call this MBA db context context add so with that being said this is what our db context is going to look like our mba db context is going to obviously uh extend db context we're going to have our constructor again the base constructor and then we're going to have only two tables so a team because obviously in the mba there are teams and then every team has players so now with the red squigglies we know what models we need to create a team model and a player model so we're going to go to models, add new item, and it's going to be called team. In our team model, all we're going to have is going to be the following. We're just going to have a team ID. So this is going to be the ID of the team, a name for the team name, and then a list of players that are on that team. So now the next thing is we need our player model. So we're going to go back to models, add new item, and we're going to call player. And then in player, we're going to have the following. So we're going to have the player ID, the name of the player, the team that they're on, the given ID, and then that's associated with the team that they obviously play on. So that is all of the models that we're going to need in this given folder. So now let's actually take what we have here. So our DB context and our two tables and go ahead and create a migration and create our database schema for our database. You're going to need to right click on your project, go to open terminal. And once you have this, first of all, usually just do a build solution. Because sometimes when you add in your packages and you add in all these models and stuff of that nature, sometimes Entity Framework gets a little bit out of whack, or it can also be a Visual Studio thing. So either you can close and open Visual Studio, or you can just run a .NET build, and usually that'll get rid of some of these random errors where you're just like, this stuff exists. Well, I don't know. So now that we have that and we have our models and we have our DB context, now we can actually create this initial migration. So we're going to actually run this command. 
This command is going to be .NET EF migrations add init create. So essentially entity framework is going to take what this is, create a snapshot of what the database schema should look like, and then create a specific migration. And then we have to take that migration and apply that to SQL Server so that it can create that given database from what Entity Framework creates. So now let's go ahead and create our migration and you guys can see the full code first approach. So I ran into an unfortunate error. <laughs> what may it be? So unable to create a DB context of type MBA DB context, the exception, no database provider has been configured. So we missed something in program.cs. So we need to actually configure that we're using SQL Server and that context in our program.cs and you do it by doing this. So in our services, we need to paste in this code that we are using the MBA DB context with SQL Server using the connection string that we set in here, which is to our MBA database, which is the name of the database that we're gonna create in our local SQL Server instance. And that's gonna be right here where we have some other databases, but when I refresh databases after I run that migration, we should have that MBA database. So now, now that we have this in our program.cs, we can now run this uh, migration again. So now that our command actually ran, we see that we now have a migrations folder with two files inside of it. So we see that we have this MBA DB context model snapshot. This is essentially the snapshot of what the database that needs to be created looks like. And here we have the instructions for the tables and the actual create table command, create table for teams and players, as well as the index. So this up right here is essentially the change that's being applied. And if we needed for some reason to revert a migration, we would use the down command and it would do the opposite of what we did up here. But now we want to actually apply this migration uh, and create our database in SQL Server. So to do that, we need to run the .NET EF database update and it will apply the migrations that are in here that have not been applied. And we'll see the changes in SQL Server as well. So I press enter on the database update command and we can see down here that info for things being created and at the end it says done. So now let's go ahead and check if our database was successfully created using the code first approach. But really quick, if you guys have found this video helpful, please drop a like on this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any of the other amazing content that I have for you guys. But now let's open up SQL Server. So going to SQL Server, I'm going to go to databases and I'm going to refresh. We now see that we have this MBA database here. So if I look at the tables, we see that we have a players table, a teams table, and then this entity framework migrations history. So what is actually in here? So we see that we have our initial create migration which is this migration right here that actually created the whole database. So essentially this table keeps track for Entity Framework, or this is how Entity Framework is able to keep track of what's in the database and what's in our API. So in the future, if we make further migrations, we don't keep recreating the database. It only applies the new changes to come. So if we added another column and we made a new migration, it would only add in the new column. But this table is very important for that. And then we have our players and teams. Okay, so we have our migrations. We were able to create our database, right? So we have our new MBA database in here. We have our models. And then now all we need to do is create our controllers and our endpoints so that we can, you know, create data and then pull that data with our endpoints. But now, what if someone were to go into the database and create a new column such as number? So every player has a number on their jersey, correct? Well, this change was made in the database. The code first approach isn't very good and not good at all for getting updates from the database because you are applying the changes to the database. You're not pulling the changes in the database if they're made in the database, right? So which approach can actually pull those database changes and apply them to our models? Well, that's going to be the database first approach. And yes, it is possible to start with the code first approach, but then also scaffold from the database schema, new models. So let me show you guys how to do that. It's actually super easy. So all you have to do is right click on your project, open in terminal, and then you should have something that looks like this. And you have to just run this command, .NET EF, DB context scaffold. And then you're gonna have name in quotations equals connection strings, MBA connection. So that is just gonna be the connection string here. So you don't actually have to put this connection string in there. You just, uh, Entity Framework just knows because of the way you have your app settings structured that connection strings MBA connection is this. So you can just put that in there. Then you have Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCourt.SQLServer. Then you have dash O models. 
So this is the output of where your scaffolded models that come from your database are going to be placed. And then the dash dash force is just going to be to overwrite these. So obviously if there's only one column change, then overwriting these is going to be fine. But if you did, if you wanted to put them somewhere else or do it a little bit differently, uh, then you could just get rid of this force, maybe put it in another folder or however you want to handle it. It's really up to you at that point. But in my case, I just want to overwrite these models. So now let's press enter and see what happens. So as we can see, some things look a little different. So in our player's model, we see that we actually got the number column. So now this column that was added in here, it's been added to our model here. So perfectly updated. We didn't have to add in anything else. And if there were other relations um, or anything else that might've been added into the database, it would all automatically be put in here, right? So you started off with the code first models that you created, and then they just get updated in case anything in the database was updated later. Then you could just quickly pull it in with one command. So the only other weird thing that you see here is that we have two contexts now. This was really because um, our app settings created an MBA database. And then when initially we created our DB context, we just called it MBA DB context. So probably ideally you would want to call this. You would probably want your MBA database to also be kind of the same name as this. So you would probably want to have MBA database context so that you don't have two contexts whenever you scaffold in. But that's the only reason that why we have two contexts. But if you matched up the names better for the database and your DB context, then you'd be all good. But that is how you can start with the code first approach and then also end up uh, with the database first approach to then just quickly scaffold changes from the database. But you quickly create from your models the database as well. But with that, that's all you needed to know on how to actually do the code first approach to create a database very quickly for your brand new application. But hey, if you want to learn more about the database first approach, watch this video right here.